Hello everybody, Shrouded Hand here. Today's episode is about a fear that I think a lot of people have experienced. Think of all those spaces in your home where you haven't looked for ages. The attic, the crawl space, the cupboard under the stairs. Surely if someone was living in there you'd know about it, right? Well, there's actually been a number of cases where this sort of thing actually happens. Somebody was able to live inside another person's house without the occupant realising, sometimes with horrifying consequences. The phenomenon even has a name, frogging, spelt with a PH. The act of secretly living within someone else's house, supposedly called because the frogger will hop from one place to another to avoid being detected. So let's look at some real life frogging cases and never really feel safe in our own homes ever again. In July of 2016, Seattle man Davis Wahlberg returned home after spending a weekend at his family's holiday cabin. At first, nothing seemed amiss. He watched some TV and went to bed, then the next day he went out to work. When he arrived home, he noticed the light on in one of the spare bedrooms. He was sure it had been off when he left that morning. This room was used when his parents stayed and they were often in the house while he was at work so he just assumed his mother had stopped by to tidy the room and left the light on. Again he watched some TV and went to bed, slept soundly. The next morning however he was awoken by a strange shuffling noise up in the attic. At first he assumed his mother had stopped by once again and was now tidying the attic, but it seemed strange that she would be there so early in the morning, so he decided to investigate. The attic was accessed via the upstairs office, but when he tried the office door he found it was locked. He could see a light on in there and he could hear someone shuffling around, so he knocked on the door. In this news report, he speaks about the response that he got. He knocked again, then heard a woman's voice. Jimmy? Is that you, Jimmy? And I'm like, no, it's not Jimmy. Uh, who is this and why are you in my house? He attempted to keep the woman there until the police arrived, but not wanting to physically restrain her, she was easily able to flee the scene before the cops got there. On further investigation, he found a screen window knocked out in an upstairs bathroom and a fire escape ladder hanging down to the decking in his garden. Presumably, the mystery woman and her friend Jimmy had been using the ladder to access the house and lived there rent free. It's lucky that it was Davis that found her and not his mother. A similar case appeared in the news in January this year. This happened in Queensland in Australia. Mother of three, Monica Green noticed strange things happening around her home. Things would move from where she left them or go missing altogether. Doors would be left ajar and lights would be left on. Her security camera also seemed to keep disabling itself for no apparent reason. She assumed that she'd been doing these things and just forgot or her kids were playing tricks. Either that or they had a poltergeist. That is until she returned home earlier than expected from a doctor's appointment. She discovered the back doors wide open, the TV and aircon were switched on and there was a half cooked meal of chicken nuggets in the oven. The police were called and they found the attic hatch open. There they found a makeshift bed, and evidence that someone had been living there for at least three weeks. The reason why this person was able to remain undetected was because Monica kept a whiteboard on her wall where she wrote her schedule for the day. The intruder knew exactly when she would be out the house. It was only because she came home early that day that she caught them out. About the experience Monica says, I felt violated. I felt like my personal space had been invaded. I felt shocked, terrified, scared. 
What had this person been doing in my house when I'm not home? Were they trying to harm me or my kids? Were they going to come down at night and murder us? There's all these unknown questions rolling around in my head. I'm finding myself constantly shaking at the smallest noise. I'm triple checking all the locks before I go to bed. I spent the night in the house last night with my family there, but being alone in the home scares me. Police took forensic evidence from Monica's house, but as I haven't seen any follow-up articles, I can only assume the intruder still hasn't been found. In 2008, a 57-year-old man from Kasuya in western Japan started to notice food going missing from his fridge. Like Monica in the last story, at first he thought he was just being forgetful. As time went on he began to take note of what food was in his fridge before he left the house. When he returned to find food missing, he knew someone else must be eating it. Suspecting someone was breaking in, he installed extra locks and made sure all the windows and doors were firmly closed whenever he left the house. Still though, food kept going missing and so, in an attempt to find the culprit, he installed a security camera that would transmit images to his phone. Sure enough, next time he left the house, the cameras picked up someone. It was a mysterious woman, helping herself to his food and watching his TV. Shortly before he was to arrive home, she carefully tidied up after herself and disappeared out of the camera's view. Police were called and when they didn't find any evidence of a forced entry, they decided to search inside the house. To their astonishment, when they opened a closet in a spare bedroom, they found a woman huddled nervously on the top shelf. She had a mattress up there and several bottles of water. Her name was Tatsuko Horikawa, a 58-year-old homeless woman who had entered the man's house when he left the front door unlocked. Ever since, she'd been living in this tiny compartment of the cupboard, only leaving her hiding place when he went out the house during the day. She was described as extremely neat and tidy, using his shower to keep clean and tidying up after herself, and only taking food that she needed. She had never stolen any money or personal belongings, so she was only charged with trespassing. The most amazing thing about this case is the length of time that she went undiscovered. She'd been living in his closet for a whole year without him realising. I'm not sure what's more disturbing. The fact that someone could live inside a stranger's house for so long without them noticing, or how weird her life must have been. For the sake of having a roof over her head, she basically confined herself to a dark box no bigger than a coffin for most of the day lying in complete silence for as long as possible, only emerging if and when the homeowner went out. What if the homeowner didn't go out for a few days, or she desperately needed the toilet while he was home? I guess that's one of the most disturbing thing about these frogging cases. The thought of the intruder lying there silently, listening to the homeowner going about their business, waiting for their moment to emerge. So this next story comes from an episode of the criminal podcast titled Bump in the Night and I don't want to rip off the story word for word but it's too creepy not to put in here. I'll put a link in the description to the podcast episode so you can listen to the whole thing and I'll give you a much shorter version of events. When 20 year old Amber Dawn first moved into her apartment in Enumclaw, Washington, she thought she could hear footsteps in the attic above her bedroom. She assumed this was just the sound of the building settling, something she would get used to once she got accustomed to her new apartment. Amber worked three jobs, so she wasn't home much and she had a regular schedule. Over the following week, she noticed things started going missing while she was out. Cans of soup and drinks. 
she thought it must be her brother who lived nearby and had a spare key. Other strange things were happening too, lights or the TV being left on. One day she came home to find her bathroom flooded and her pet dog sat in the bathroom sink. The dog was a puppy at the time and the sink was too high for it to climb up to on its own so somebody must have put it in there. I think at this point I would have bailed out of there and called the police but Amber just put it down to nothing and continued living there listening to the creaks coming from the attic above her. It was only after six months of living there that she eventually deviated from her schedule. She called in sick to work one day and stayed home. At around 7pm she heard a loud noise in the bedroom but assumed it was one of her pets. At 11pm she decided to have a bath and this is when things finally dawned on her. As she lay there in the bath she noticed that the hatch in the ceiling above her head was wide open and it had definitely been closed earlier that day. She realised then that the footsteps she'd been hearing weren't just the building settling. Even worse, she realised that the noise she heard earlier in the bedroom wasn't her pets. Whoever had been living in her attic was now hiding in her closet. Very slowly, she climbed out of the bath, grabbed her clothes and crept past the bedroom with its hidden intruder. She snuck out of the house armed with a hammer and called the police. By the time they arrived and were able to search the apartment, the intruder had left, but they found a sleeping bag and half-eaten food up in the attic. The intruder was never caught. Twenty years later, Amber is still haunted by thoughts of who the person was, living above her head, undiscovered for six months. I'm going to look now at the case of Daniel LaPlante. Born 1970 in Townsend, Massachusetts, Daniel was known as a weird kid. Probably this is because of the massive amounts of sexual and physical abuse he had received from his stepfather and other adults while he was growing up. As a teenager he started breaking into other people's homes. Usually this was while their homeowners were still in. He quickly became skilled at sneaking around someone's house without being discovered. He got a kick out of moving stuff about so that when the homeowner woke up the next morning they would know that someone had been in their property. In 1986, Daniel got hold of the number of a 15 year old girl named Annie Andrews and began calling her. As they were both around the same age they quickly struck up a friendship and eventually agreed to go on a date. The date however didn't go well. Daniel came across as weird and awkward. Annie had recently lost her mother to cancer and Daniel seemed morbidly curious about it, asking Annie way too many questions about the death. Needless to say, Annie didn't go on a second date with Daniel and broke contact with him shortly afterwards. Daniel didn't take this rejection well and one night he decided to break into Annie's home. He found a small cupboard-like space in the bathroom wall that the plumbing ran through. For the next two months, he would hide in this tiny space while spying on and tormenting the family. The accounts of what he actually did during this time are pretty varied. The problem with this story is that over the years it's become something of an urban legend. Even though it really did happen, as the story got told and retold over the years, a lot of the specifics have been so embellished that it's hard to tell which bits are accurate or not. In some versions of the story, Daniel managed to get into the walls of the house and creep around, spying on the family through air vents. In other versions, he simply hid in his cubby hole and snuck around the house at night, sometimes hiding himself in the basement. 
It's reported that Anna and her eight-year-old sister Jessica conducted a seance to try and contact their dead mother. Daniel, who was hiding in the wall nearby, started tapping on pipes in response to their questions. The girls thought that they'd contacted their mother and proceeded to have conversations with her, believing that the knocking sounds were messages from the afterlife. Over the coming weeks, the tapping noises would increase in frequency, so much so that the girls were being kept up at night with the incessant knocks and taps. One day they noticed that the knocking noise seemed to be coming from the basement, so they decided to investigate. On the basement wall, in what appeared to be blood, they found the words, I'm in your bedroom, come and find me. Naturally, the girls ran screaming from the basement and they told their father what they'd found. He went down there to check and indeed, he too found the strange message. However, he noticed that it wasn't blood, but ketchup. He assumed that his daughters had been playing a prank on him and took it no further. The tapping noises continued to torment the girls. Sometimes when they went out of a room, they would return to find objects had moved around. By now they were convinced that it wasn't their mother that they'd contacted, but a demonic entity. One night the girls entered Annie's bedroom to find the words I'm back, come and find me, daubed on the wall in red writing. Understandably terrified they ran from the house and went to a neighbour. From the neighbour's house they called their father at work and told him to come home. When the father entered the house it was in complete disarray. Furniture had been flung about the place and there were other messages written on the walls. One of them said, marry me. Now, things get a bit hazy here because at some point after entering his house, the father is confronted by Daniel LaPlante. In some versions of the story, Daniel is dressed in the dead mother's clothes, wearing a blonde wig and makeup. Others say that he was dressed as a Native American. Then I found people saying he wasn't really dressed as anything and these details were added in later by newspapers wanting to make the story a bit more interesting. So anyway, whatever he's dressed as, the father chases Daniel but he manages to get away, seeming to duck into a room and disappear without a trace. The police are called and they conduct a thorough search of the property. They open the cupboard door and they find Daniel the plant curled up, holding a hatchet. For these actions, Daniel spent one year in juvenile detention. Annie and her family were traumatised, but in a way they had a lucky escape. A couple of months after getting out of juvie, Daniel LaPlante broke into the home of 33-year-old Priscilla Gustafson. Her body was found the next day, face down on her bed. She had been raped and then shot multiple times in the head at point-blank range. Her two children, Five-year-old William and eight-year-old Abigail had been drowned in the bathtub. Within 24 hours of this crime, Daniel broke into another woman's home and kidnapped her at gunpoint, forcing her into his car. She luckily managed to escape and Daniel was caught soon after, hiding out in a dumpster. He was given three life sentences for the murder of the Gustafson family. Like I say, Annie and her family probably had a lucky escape. Finally, let's look at the case of Theodore Edward Conies, also known as the Denver Spider-Man. Born in Illinois in 1882, Theodore Conies was a sickly child who doctors said wouldn't live to see his 18th birthday. As a result, he dropped out of high school and didn't really learn any skills that would have found him employment later in life. After all, if you're told you're not going to see adulthood, why would you need to learn life skills? By September 1941, the 59-year-old Theodore was still very much alive, but unable to find work, he was homeless, starving and extremely frail. 
Sensing a harsh winter coming, he decided to visit the home of one of the few people that had shown him kindness in his life, 73-year-old Philip Peters. Back when Theodore was 17, he and Philip had been members of the same mandolin players club. They became friends and Theodore was often invited to have dinner with Philip and his wife Helen. As Theodore descended into homelessness and poverty, he and Philip drifted apart. By the time Theodore arrived at Philip's house on that day in September 1941, they hadn't seen each other for about 30 years and he wasn't even sure if Philip would recognise him. He needn't have worried though because there was no response when he knocked on the door. The house was empty. Two weeks earlier Philip's wife had broken her hip and he was now at the hospital visiting her. Theodore decided to try the back door and when he found it unlocked he entered the house and helped himself to some food. With the house to himself he decided to have a look round and he found a small hatch in the ceiling of a closet space. This led to a tiny cubby hole in the attic, a place filled with dirt and spiders. He crawled in there and lay still. Pretty soon Philip would be coming home. For the next five weeks, Theodore Coney's hid in the attic space completely undiscovered. He only left to steal food from the kitchen. His plan seemed to be working quite well until on October the 17th, Theodore made a terrible mistake. Thinking that Philip had left the house to visit his wife, Theodore crept out of the attic and went to steal food from the icebox. Philip, however, was still in the house. He was simply taking a nap in another room. Hearing the commotion coming from the kitchen, Philip confronted Theodore. He didn't recognise his old friend. Philip attacked him with his walking stick, then headed to the phone to call the police. Theodore was armed with an old pistol and smacked him over the head with the butt of the weapon. Then he picked up a cast iron stove shaker and bludgeoned Philip to death. Once Philip was dead, Theodore finished making himself some dinner, washed the blood off the stove shaker, then returned to his hiding place in the attic. Philip Peters was due to visit his neighbour that evening. When he didn't turn up, they decided to check in on him and found his lifeless body in a downstairs bedroom. Police searched the house thoroughly, but they found no signs of forced entry into the property. They even found the attic hatch, but when they pushed it, they found it was firmly shut. In fact, at this point, Theodore was sat on top of the hatch, keeping them from opening it. They decided that the hatch was too small for a human to crawl through anyway and they didn't investigate further. Perhaps if they'd known how emaciated Philip's killer was, they might have thought otherwise. The following February, Helen Peters had recovered enough to return to the house. By now though, the property had gained a reputation for being haunted. Local people reported seeing lights on in the house or a strange face peering out through a crack in the curtains. The fact that someone had recently been murdered there only helped to fuel the idea that the place was home to a restless spirit. Without a husband to look after her, Helen enlisted two nurses to come to the house and help her recuperate. Helen was hard of hearing and mostly confined to one room, so she didn't notice anything unusual, but both the nurses soon started to spot strange things happening around the house. Food would go missing and furniture would move when nobody else was around. They would hear weird tapping noises in the walls and soft footsteps coming from empty rooms. Maybe the stories about the house being haunted were true. It came to a head one night when one of the nurses, Edith Clark, heard a door slowly creak open and looked over to see a pale, skeletal hand come through. She screamed and the figure retreated. She saw the dark outline of a man running up the stairs. Police were called and once more they searched the house. They even stayed in the property for 48 hours but there was no sign of this mystery figure. 
Edith became convinced that the man she saw must have been a ghost and resigned from her position. Shortly afterwards, the second nurse, Hattie Johnson, resigned too, stating that she wasn't going to stay in no haunted house. With nobody to look after her, Helen Peters moved in with her son at his house in Grand River. Her old house now stood completely empty, or so they thought. Police started getting calls from local people who had seen lights going on and off inside the Denver property. Sometimes they would see the shadow of a person moving about inside. The police decided to set up a regular patrol of the house. Once a day they would swing by and go inside and check for signs of entry. After all, they still had an unsolved murder on their hands and no other leads to go on. It wasn't until July of 1942, over ten months after Theodore first entered the house, that they got their break. During a routine patrol of the property, they heard a scuffling noise from upstairs. They ran up just in time to see a filthy pair of legs disappearing into the hatch in the ceiling. Grabbing hold, they managed to drag Theodore out of his hiding place. The state of him was something to behold. He was filthy and completely emaciated. His rotten clothes hung from his frame in tatters. The attic space had a foul stench. In there they found a bed made from an old ironing board covered in magazines. There were bits of half-eaten food everywhere and there were cans filled with his bodily waste lining the walls. The whole place was covered in cobwebs. A detective later told the press, a man would have to be a spider to stand it long up there. During questioning, Theodore provided some interesting insights into what it was like to live in that house. He says, Every night I would listen at the hole until I heard him snoring. Then I would crawl out and go through the icebox and would just take enough so that it wouldn't be too noticeable. I would carry it back to my nest and eat it there. I found parts of an old crystal set in one of the closets and a pair of earphones. I fixed it up so it would work and I listened to all the newscasts, music and everything. I used to beat it down to the bathroom and even shaved with the old man's razor. Whenever I heard him downstairs I kept real still. Then I got bolder and I used to shadow him from room to room. It was sort of a game, it gave me a thrill. It was the first time in my life I'd ever had anyone at my mercy but I didn't want to hurt him. It was miserable hot in the summer and my feet froze in the dead of winter in the attic but it was all part of the price I was willing to pay. I can't tell you why I stuck it out. I guess it was mostly because it was a world all my own. It's been a nightmare. Nearly ten months of hellish terrible nightmare and now that it's all coming open I feel relief. You can't live like a creature damned without thinking thoughts that burn deep into your soul. He was sentenced to life imprisonment in Colorado State Penitentiary. It was probably the first time in decades that he'd had a proper bed to sleep on and regular meals. He died in prison in 1967. He was 84 years of age. If anything, these stories show that it's a lot easier than I thought to hide in another person's house without being caught. Every building makes weird bangs and creaking noises, especially at night, so I imagine our brains are conditioned not to wake up at every little bump in the night. So maybe give it a second thought, next time you hear a footstep on the stairs or shuffling in the attic, it might not be the house settling. Thank you very much for watching the video. I know it's been a couple of weeks since my last upload but I've been kind of under the weather for the last month so I decided to take some time to rest up so I didn't get too exhausted. Shout out to everyone supporting the channel on Patreon. I have paused my Patreon this month so I could have a rest but I still appreciate everyone sticking around and all the new people that have signed up so cheers to all these people. Okay, anyway, I'll see you on the next video.
in the meantime i've probably got some older stuff you haven't watched yet maybe there's one on screen now i don't know all right until next time goodbye